The Greek Gods While not worshipped by many anymore, the Greek gods are still in our lives. They are depicted in the compendium of Western art and literature. They indirectly give us the names of our planets, days of the week, and names of the months. They show up in the names of products, in our movies, and in our books. You'll often hear that the ancient Greeks had 12 main gods, and that's true. Yet there were dozens, if not hundreds, of Greek gods, demigods, and spirits within their pantheon. I obviously won't go over all of them here, but I believe there are 20 gods that everyone should know. The ancient Greeks had no Bible or equivalent. There was no canonical version of their mythology. I'll be using a modified version of Hesiod's Theogony, but if I mention a god or myth associated with said god, don't be surprised if it's different from the version you know. In the beginning, there was chaos, a swirling void of nothingness and orderlessness. From this chaos sprung Gaia, the Earth. She was the mother of all creation. Every god and every monster can be traced back to her. She bore a number of primordial gods, but the most important was Uranus. Uranus was the sky. Together, Uranus and Gaia produced many creatures and deities. And yeah, you'll have to get used to some strange incestuous relationships in this story, but don't worry, they're gods, not people. Now, Uranus was a pretty awful father. He hated his children and locked them away in the bowels of the earth. This enraged Gaia, and so she gave a sickle to one of her sons, Kronos. Kronos then defeated and castrated his father, becoming the new ruler of the gods. This generation of gods were called the Titans. As I said, Kronos was the king of the Titans, and god of agriculture, the harvest, and time. Kronos married his sister, Rhea. She was also an agricultural goddess, and was later worshipped as the mother of the gods. Kronos and Rhea ruled over the golden age of Greek mythology, but while times may have been golden for some, they weren't so good for Cronus's children. You see, when Uranus was defeated by Cronus, he gave a prophecy that Cronus would befall the same fate as him. As punishment for betraying his father, Cronus would be overthrown by one of his own children. Cronus, who was terrified of this, ate his first five children when they were born. Rhea, who wasn't a fan of seeing her children devoured by her husband, hatched a plan. She hid away her sixth-born son and gave Kronos a stone swaddled in cloth instead. Kronos, who we can only guess wasn't too observant, swallowed the stone and thought nothing else of it. Rhea then took her son, named Zeus, to be raised by nymphs. When he grew up, he snuck his father a poison that made him throw up his other children. This started the Titanomachy, a war between the Olympians led by Zeus and the Titans led by Kronos. It lasted 10 years, and in the end, the Olympians won. Zeus then imprisoned the Titans in Tartarus, the deepest pit of the underworld. So let's meet these new rulers of the universe. First, we have Zeus. Though he was last born, he was the strongest of his siblings and took over his father's throne as king of the gods. He was lord of the sky and god of thunder, destiny, and kingship. His symbol was his thunderbolt, made by the mighty Cyclopses. He was also famously promiscuous, having dozens upon dozens of children, both god and mortal, with dozens of women. His wife was Hera. She was the queen of the gods and goddess of motherhood, marriage, and the stars. She was famously unhappy with Zeus's infidelity, often cursing or killing Zeus's mistresses and children. Poseidon was given dominion of the sea, and was king and god of it. One of his titles was the Earth Shaker, as he was the cause of earthquakes and tsunamis. He was also god of horses for some reason. Demeter was the goddess of the harvest, grain, and of agriculture. She was most well known for the story of her daughter, but we'll get to that later. Next we have Hestia. 
She is often forgotten when talking about the gods of ancient Greece, so much so that people fail to include her in the Twelve Olympians. But she was one. She was the goddess of hearth and home, and tender of the fire of Olympus. Last of the children of Kronos and Rhea was Hades. He was the god of the dead and king of the underworld, but he wasn't actually included in the Twelve Olympians, as his dwelling was in the land of the dead, not Mount Olympus. So those are the first six, or five, Olympians. Before we move on to the second generation, we have another goddess to cover. Aphrodite was the goddess of love and beauty, and she may have been the oldest Olympian of them all. When Crotos castrated his father, Uranus, his, hmm, let's say privates were hurled into the sea. From this event came the sea foam, and through some godly magic, Aphrodite was born. So there's our first generation of Olympians. The next six are all children of Zeus. The first were the twins Artemis and Apollo. They were the children of Zeus and the titaness Leto. Artemis was the goddess of untamed nature, the hunt, and wild animals. She was a maiden goddess, and was said to have an aversion to men other than her brother. She was also a moon goddess, though not the only one in Greek mythology. Her twin Apollo was the god of archery, poetry, art, and prophecy. The famed oracle of Delphi was the high priestess of the Temple of Apollo. This temple in Delphi was thought to be the center of the world to the ancient Greeks. Next to Zeus, Apollo was probably the most important god of the Greek pantheon. As with his sister, Apollo was a sun god, though again, not the only one in Greek myth. Next we have the goddess Athena. Her birth story is a weird one. One day, Zeus woke up with a monster headache. It grew so bad that he asked one of the other gods to cleave open his skull with an axe. The god did so, and the goddess Athena sprang from Zeus's head fully grown and fully armored. Athena was the goddess of wisdom, of strategy, and of battlecraft. She is the last of our maiden goddesses, joining Hestia and Artemis. The city of Athens was named after her, and she was its patron deity and protector. Along with her dominion over warcraft, she was also a goddess of domestic crafts, like weaving. So Zeus's wife Hera was not pleased that Zeus had a child without her help. So she decided to have a child without his. Through some godly magic, she did just that, and bore Hephaestus. Unfortunately, Hephaestus was born lame, meaning disabled. It's suggested by his epithet Kylopodion that he was born with a club foot, but it's a little unclear. Whatever his handicap was, it was enough for Hera to cast her infant son out of Olympus. Mm. Luckily, he was found by Thetis, the sea nymph, and was raised in her abode. There among the nymphs, they taught him the art of metalwork and smithing. He proved to be good at this. In fact, he proved to be the greatest metalworker anybody had ever seen. As revenge on his mother, he presented Hera a beautiful golden throne when he was invited back to Olympus. He enchanted the throne to trap Hera when she sat on it. Zeus begged Hephaestus to free her, which he promised to do if he was given Aphrodite's hand in marriage. Zeus agreed, much to Aphrodite's uh, frustration, and Hera was freed. Hephaestus was the blacksmith of the gods, and the god of metalwork and fire. Next we have Ares, the god of war. He was, funnily enough, the only of the twelve Olympians born of Zeus and his wife Hera. Ares was the god of bloodshed and violence, but also of courage and discipline. He famously had an adulterous affair with Aphrodite, the goddess of love. And lastly of the Olympians is Hermes. He was son of Zeus and Maia. He was the messenger and herald of the gods, as well as the god of travelers, merchants, and thieves. He was a trickster god, as well as a bringer of knowledge. When he was a child, he stole Apollo's sacred cattle as a prank. 
When Zeus found this out, he was amused by Hermes's gall. After Hermes returned Apollo's cattle on Zeus's orders, as well as showed Apollo his lyre, which he had invented, all was forgiven, and he became one of the twelve Olympians. And those are the twelve Olympians. But we're not done yet. There are a few minor gods that are still very important to know. First we have Persephone. She was the daughter of Zeus and Demeter, and her story was one of the most important myths in Greek religion. You see, Hades, god of the underworld, fell in love with her. He went to his brother Zeus and asked for her hand in marriage. Zeus agreed, while conveniently forgetting to tell either Persephone or her mother Demeter. So one day, when Persephone was chilling with some nymphs, a crack appeared in the earth. Out from it came Hades, who kidnapped Persephone and took her to the underworld. Her mother Demeter was so distraught that all of the vegetation on earth started to die. Zeus, realizing that the only way to calm Demeter's wrath was to get her daughter back, sent Hermes to fetch her. But Persephone had eaten a pomegranate from the underworld, and this tied her to the place. So she was forced to live in the underworld with her husband for a third of the year. This story acted as an explanation for the seasons. Persephone was in the underworld during winter, and when she was on Olympus, it was spring. Next we have Dionysus. Dionysus was born of Zeus and Semele, the princess of Thebes. Yep, this is the first character we've come across who had a mortal mother. That said, Semele was herself a demigod, as she was the daughter of the goddess Harmonia. When Dionysus was conceived, the ever-jealous and spiteful Hera killed Semele. Zeus then took the unborn Dionysus and sewed him into his thigh. Dionysus was then born from Zeus's thigh. Because of this, Dionysus was often called twice born. He was the god of wine, festivity, and madness. Since he was technically part human, though immortal, he acted as a bridge between the mortal world and the divine. This made him one of the most popular Greek gods. Lastly, Eros, better known today by his Roman name Cupid, was the son of Aphrodite and Ares. He was, like his mother, a god of love and desire. Interestingly, in Hesiod's Theogony, and in other early accounts, Eros is presented as a primordial god of the same generation as Gaia and Uranus. But in later Hellenistic times, as well as in Rome, he was always thought to be the child of Aphrodite and Ares. He's of course famous for his bow and arrow that he would use to make people, and even other gods, fall in love. So those are the 20 Greek gods I think everyone should know. Let me know in the comments any favorite gods of yours I missed. I think I will do a follow-up video because there are so many interesting gods and goddesses from ancient Greece to cover. If you want to support the channel, please consider donating to my Patreon. Or just like and subscribe. Bye!